We managed to make it into Valone in the late afternoon. The Hotel Occital, located near the town center, was perfect. It was clean, it was comfortable, and a far cry from the disaster hotel that we stayed at in Cherbourg. I of course couldn't feel my feet and had to lay in bed for about an hour until the feeling returned. During that time, it became clear that we had made it just in the nick of time. A huge storm hit that night with drenching rain and fierce winds. It would have really sucked if we had been out in the open in that. That night, we ventured out to the nearby Lake Ramor, which was a really cool bar. The wine and the food was awesome. Regardless, after that really long hike, we both slept really well that night. The next morning, there was a lovely fog that had moved in from the English Channel. I was up early and decided to go wandering on my own. Valone is just beautiful. Per Google, it's got a population of nearly 7,000 people, but it's charming and it's quaint and just about as endearing as a place can get. In fact, Valone was once regarded as the Versailles of Normandy. Rich people at one point would come here and build their mansions, including the Hotel de Beaumont, which is now a tourist attraction. Valone still has a bunch of its medieval flair. You can see old city walls everywhere. There was even a courtyard that had a playground, but on one end were the ruins of a stone arch, and I question if this might have been a church at one point. The Murderay River makes its way through the city, and there are a lot of bridges over it, again just adding to the ambiance. Now, I did manage to walk past the Hotel de Beaumont, or maybe that might be Hotel de Beaumont, which at one point was the headquarters for both the Wehrmacht and then later for the American Army. As I got to the center of town, I saw the Gothic Église Saint-Malo de Valone. It's a relatively small church that was heavily damaged, like a lot of the city, by Allied bombing. The people of Valone have since lovingly rebuilt it. In fact, it reopened for services back in 1962. What's more, the exterior western wall has these old medieval blocks from the original church which were scavenged and repurposed into it. I personally found that really fascinating that they would do that. During the Allied invasion, Valone was a strategic hotspot. The main highway and the main railway ran through the center of town. It also had key bridges over the Murderay River, which as Tom Hanks in Saving Private Ryan would say, was prime real estate. The aforementioned Hotel de Beaumont was a regional headquarters and a medical facility. Thus, it would serve as a communication hub for the Germans, and then later for the Americans. The Germans wanted to keep it as a defensive position. It would be, for them, the last stronghold before Cherbourg. On June 19, 1944, approximately two weeks after the Allies had landed, the American 8th Infantry Regiment of the 4th Division, that is, the division that landed at Utah Beach, arrived on the outskirts of the city. The 1st Battalion was ordered to scout out the city. All they found were ruins. The 91st and 709th German Grenadier Divisions had already pulled out about three days before. They were compelled by Allied bombing to fall back to Cherbourg. Now, there were a few bunkers and strong points that they left behind, but beyond that, there wasn't much left. The American army didn't stick around for long. It pushed on to Cherbourg, where the Germans were literally cornered. That battle, which I covered in the last video, was intense. But once Cherbourg was taken, the peninsula would fall quickly. Chase eventually got up, and together we went out to get some coffee on the main square. By the way, we found a really nice coffee shop called the Bar des Voyageurs, which I think I'm pronouncing correctly. It means the Bar of the Travelers. Now, considering how much Valone was damaged in 1944, what exists now is just amazing. It's so tranquil. You'd never think that anything had happened here. Everywhere we looked, life just went on. We watched people go to work, and the older folks of the town just getting together and meeting up with their friends over breakfast. What's more, I couldn't get over just how polite everybody was. I don't think there was a person we walked past that wouldn't say good morning or at least hello. Leaving Valone behind, we headed out to the east. We took some back roads that went along the main highway. 
It wasn't long till we got to the small town of Monteburg. This was another small town located on the main road to Cherbourg. However, unlike Valone, the Germans here put up a very stiff resistance. On June 10, 1944, that is D-Day plus four, the 12th Infantry Regiment under Colonel Reeder and the 8th Infantry Regiment under Colonel Van Fleet, both of which were contingents of the 4th Infantry Division that came up on Utah Beach, came under attack as they were on approach to Monteburg. Portions of the German 91st and 729th Infantry Divisions counterattacked in the evening and managed to stop the Allied advance, at least for a short time. The next morning when the sun arose and the battlefield was illuminated, the American commanders called in numerous airstrikes and naval bombardments. These would continue for the next nine days. They staggered the Germans in the town, but also leveled Monteburg and the areas surrounding it to the west. Meanwhile, the 8th Infantry Regiment, supported by Sherman tanks of the 70th Tank Battalion, bypassed the city and arrived on the western approaches. At 3 a.m. on June 19th, General Raymond Barton, known as Tubby, who was the commander of the entire 4th Division, ordered a two-pronged attack, the 8th Regiment from the west and the 12th from the east. Brutal fighting ensued all over the area. The Germans eventually got overwhelmed. But just before they were about to collapse, they were ordered to withdraw to avoid encirclement. The American army would eventually enter into the town, but by then, there was nothing left but ruins. Chase and I entered Monteburg along the main street on the western side of the town. Here we stopped to get lunch and a beer. They have this stuff called Ruby Leffy that wasn't bad. What can I say, I'm a sucker for Belgian beer. Now, all along the main strip, there were these signs that were hanging from the lampposts. They had pictures of the men who had fought in Normandy. The locals had put them up to commemorate Allied servicemen. Even after 80 years, they were still paying their respect to these soldiers. But what was especially impressive is that the people that they had put up were not just random soldiers who had been involved somewhere in Operation Overlord. Rather, the men that were on these signs had served some function in that particular area. We'd see signs like this throughout Normandy, and not just in cities or towns, but even in the smallest villages. It's a heck of a way of saying thank you. After finishing up our lunch, we put on our backpacks and then made our way out of town to the southeast. We were quickly back in the Bocage. We made our way through Yogenville, taking back roads, which were surprisingly busy. At times, it was simply easier to take dirt paths, even if they had become muddy in the prior night's rain. Just about two hours later, we arrived at Azaville. The Azaville Battery was a heavily fortified artillery position. It was one of many that the Wehrmacht had created in Normandy, and for that matter, along the entire coast of France. This was a part of Hitler's vaunted Atlantic Wall. It was designed to keep anybody from invading the Third Reich. The Atlantic Wall by 1944 was by no means complete, and these fixed fortifications were a far cry from the highly mobile blitzkrieg that the German army was well known for in the early part of the war. Now, construction on this particular site started as early as 1941, and by 1944 there were four main positions or casemates. Each casemate housed a large gun. Most could fire a 105mm shell. It had barracks, machine gun nests, anti-aircraft guns, and storage facilities. Surrounding it was a minefield. Plus, it was built up on a slight hill, and most of the trees had been cut down, giving it a clear line of fire. It was essentially a fortress designed to operate even if it was surrounded and was positioned so it could hit ships in the channel and anything coming in on Utah Beach. Allied bombers had tried to take it out unsuccessfully. There was just too much concrete. On June 6th, a component of the 101st Airborne that had been grossly misdropped attempted to attack it and was repulsed. The battery continued to fire for the next three days. It harassed the 4th Infantry Division as it was coming in on Utah Beach. 
However, on June 9th, the U.S. Navy brought in the USS Nevada, a veteran of the Pearl Harbor attack, and shelled the position. The battleship got in a lucky shot and took out casemate number one, killing everybody inside. Later that day, the 22nd Infantry Regiment attacked the battery with demolition charges and flamethrowers. One of the ammunition depots was ignited in the fight, and the resulting explosion was said to have shook the ground. The Germans eventually surrendered the position that afternoon at approximately 2.30 p.m. During our hike across Normandy, we'd see a lot of fortified positions like this one, but Asville was perhaps one of the better ones. The site was well taken care of, the vegetation had been nicely trimmed down, and the bunkers were only partially flooded with what the caretakers would affectionately call bunker juice. We walked about the tunnels and got a sense of what it must have been like to be one of the defenders. It's now a super serene place, and cows graze where there were once bomb craters. By the way, don't bother bringing a drone here, they won't let you use them. Also, the gift shop had some of the best books on D-Day I've ever seen. Now leaving the battery behind, we made our way to the south. It was still an hour and a half to get to our next stop. However, this portion of the walk, we would not be so lucky. Another storm was making its way towards us. We tried to keep ahead of it, but we ended up getting soaked. The last hour of the walk was with rain ponchos on, and Chase thought it was hilarious that I looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame. It wasn't until the late afternoon that we finally saw where we were going to spend the night. On the horizon, rising up from the small buildings, was the steeple of St. Marie Eglise. This is a town that I've always wanted to see. It has been immortalized in every D-Day book and movie out there. I mean, after all, this was the first place to be liberated during the Normandy invasion. Seeing that, I no longer cared that I was wet. This was going to be an awesome stop, and not just because we had really good hotel reservations for the night, but more importantly, we were officially entering into airborne country. <laughs> 